So I got this PS5 a few days ago and I haven't taken it out of the box yet because I don't have any games to play in it. I suppose I could throw it in the trash. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tark Talks. You know the deal. On this program, I tell you a bunch of things you already know and I give you my thoughts on them. It's a pretty chill program and we always, sometimes, have a good time. Bad time. On today's program, there was a big Dragon Quest event with lots of reveals. Kenichiro Takaki is working on a new game that has some fans concerned. Summer Game Fest brought us a lot of cool trailers and reveals. We got new trademarks from Bandai Namco that might hint at something really cool or, you know, might hint at nothing at all. And E3 has has officially come and gone. But at the end of this program, to close things off, we're gonna talk about possibly changing how Tark Talks is handled going forward. And that's something that I'm definitely gonna want your guys' opinion on. But before all that, a word from today's sponsor. I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of you out there who wanted to get into making YouTube videos or podcasts, but the price of the whole thing maybe scared you off. And understandably so, this stuff can be pretty expensive. For reference, here's all the gear I use on every episode just for the sound. It's expensive, right? But what if I told you it didn't have to be? Enthusiastically tell us more. This is the Fifine K678 Cardioid Condenser Microphone. This thing comes at half the price of other industry-leading USB mics. And just look at that packaging. Of course, price is only half the battle and you're probably wondering how it sounds. Well, you tell me. I've been using it for this whole video so far. But maybe your interests lie outside of voice recording. Allow me to serenade you while we get into the nerd stuff. The Fifine K678 is a simple and convenient plug and play device. Plug it in and you're good to go. No hassle, no steep learning curve, no extra gear required. Everything you need is in the box. The mic itself, a desktop stand, an adapter for any other stand you might want to use, the USB cable, and of course, all the black foam your cats could ever want thrown at them. Record in 16 bits up to 48 kilohertz sample rates and capture a bandwidth of 40 to 20,000 hertz. Built into the body of this mic, we have an active mute button and an LED light that lets you know what's going on. The headphone jack on the bottom allows you to easily monitor what you're doing or hold a close and comfortable conversation with people over Discord, Skype, or Zoom. Around the back, we have headphone volume control as well as the mic gain dial, allowing for quick and easy sensitivity adjustments on the fly. This microphone is built to enhance the sound of your voice and accentuate frequencies that will give you both more low-end body and high-end clarity. If you have any creative itch you just want to satisfy or just want to sound better for the people on the other end of your online calls, and you don't want to break the bank, the Fifine K678 is here for you. Just follow the link in the description and order yours today. So now that we've established that my voice is reaching through to you with clarity, let's get into the Dragon Quest event. As part of Dragon Quest's 35th anniversary celebration, Square Enix held a live stream chock full of new game reveals. Suffice to say the least, Dragon Quest fans were eating good. Among these games, we had Dragon Quest Quest Treasures, a sort of treasure hunting RPG spin-off, a new Dragon Quest X expansion, of course exclusive to Japan just as the MMO is, a Dragon Quest X offline version, essentially the MMO stripped down to a single player experience, then we had Dragon Quest Keshikishi, a puzzle game for mobile devices, Dragon Quest XII, The Embers of Fate, which I assume is supposed to be the big reveal but it was just a logo reveal, so uh, I, I don't know, whatever. Apparently this is going to be a darker Dragon Quest game, more aimed at a than previous entries, which kind of undermines the series to some extent, but I'm open to seeing how it goes. It might be cool. And there was also the Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D remake. This was by far my biggest takeaway. Another game built in the Octopath engine and perfectly matched for it. I've never exactly been much of a Dragon Quest fan, so this event wasn't really for me exactly. However, this DQ3 remake, the aesthetics of it all, is grabbing my attention enough that I may just consider this a day one buy when it makes it over here. And I know graphics ain't everything and all that jazz, but visually it speaks to me and I am so ready for it. As far as that live stream goes though, that was really all there was for me. In other new game news, Kenichiro Takaki, crazy boob man behind Senran Kagura, Valkyrie Drive, Kendagawa Jet Girls, and more, has a new game in development and it might not be what people were expecting. In his first director and producer role on a major game since joining Psy Games, Kenichiro finds himself working on Project GAM. 
Nice games. Not all that much is exactly known about this. However, it seems to be an action fantasy game in a world of magic and machines. It's centered around a young male mage protagonist, but there is also a small cast of other playable characters. The game seems to have a focus on multiplayer and competitive play as well. Now, in all that, you might not have heard much mention of, um physics, shall we say. Well, it remains to be seen if that's going to be much of an angle to the game or not. Given Psygame's other works, I wouldn't be surprised if it is to some extent, but the lack of mention has had some folks on social media get a bit worked up. As for me, I'm open to seeing what Takaki can do here. While I like that he was just kind of the guy for heavy anime boobage games, I also don't like seeing people get boxed in that way. And between you and me, the last few properties he directed left me pretty underwhelmed. So maybe he here at Psy Games, he can find whatever he's been missing for the past few years and actually develop a solid game again. Moving along, we had a few upcoming JRPGs reveal some cast details, and while we could spend a long time here pouring over them, that's uh, not something I really want to do. This talk will end up real cheap if the characters end up not developing that well in their games when they release. But yeah, anyway, here is the Kuro no Kaseki cast. At a glance, I like them. Most of them have great designs, as familiar as some of them may seem. There's a lot of variety in their ages and visual identity, so I can't wait to see how they actually work as a team. We also seen some returning characters from the previous arcs as well. While I can take or leave some of them, as we've definitely seen enough of most of them already, I'm always happy to catch up with the old cast. Plus, Zin is here. If anybody needed more time to develop, it's him. So yeah, that's cool and all, but um, did y'all see the hot night from Tales of Arise? Cause like, god damn. So Tales of Arise has revealed our main playable cast and I gotta say, this game just keeps looking better and better. Dohalim was showcased alongside Kisara, the Shield Knight Lady, and like, yeah, they look pretty badass. Dohalim is a bow staff wielder, Kisara is a very underutilized mace wielder. Standing alongside Law and Rinwell, it's looking like our B cast is going to be just as interesting as our two frontrunners, Alfin and Shion. Of course, they could always fumble, but like, I have faith right now, and and it feels good to have it. Even with Sestiria feeling recent in my memory, I have basically zero reservations about Arise. The combat looks cool, the world looks cool, the characters look cool, the music is, you know, it's Tales of music for better or worse. Anyway, day one for me, I've had a major itch to play a Tales game lately, and this one cannot come fast enough. Next up, Elden Ring has also shown up to reconfirm its existence. And I know the Soulsborne games are quote unquote too Western for some of my viewers, but like like, man, this is looking way better than I expected it to, and I don't exactly have low expectations when it comes to From Software. Elden Ring is looking like a combination of everything From Soft has delivered to us over the past 10 years. The combat and setting are looking really promising so far. The light narrative elements we got seem intriguing enough, and the creature designs. My god, I love them. And there's so many of them in this trailer. Weird hundred arm demon looking guy, floor squid, ghost deer, mush face. Enemy and boss variety is not a problem this game is going to have. And the advancements that they've made in their animations, the lighting, the cloth and hair physics, this stuff is just looking so clean. I do wonder if NPCs will have lip sync though. For some reason, that's just not something FromSoft usually bothers with. And the couple times they have bothered, it's been a little odd. Either way, this too will easily be a day Day one purchase, as every FromSoft game has been the past decade. It's been amazing watching their development as a studio, and I fully intend to continue this ride with them. So let's stop there for now, take a look at some small stories with a scaled back Tark's tidbits. In smaller news, visual novel Air will be coming to Switch, and though there's no word on an English localization yet, I'm not ruling it out. Usually these ports are signs of good things to come. If they could make Clannad successful, then surely translating Air and getting it official to Westerners should turn a profit as well, especially if that translation is put on PC and maybe PlayStation 4 and 5 as well as Switch. Soundtrack composer Yoko Kano will be returning to work on the live-action Netflix adaptation of Cowboy Bebop, and while Netflix has had some embarrassing foyers into this territory before, this at least is a step in the right direction for them. Moving along, Alex Kidd in Miracle World DX has had its release date moved up to June 22nd, 2021. Though I played a lot of Alex Kidd games on emulator, 
emulator way back in the day and think the visuals in the new one look really nice, I'm probably not coming back to this series, but I'm happy to see that it lives. Rune Factory 5, unfortunately for those of us in the West, has been delayed until 2022, and at least sharing the release year, we got the reveal for Monarch, a new turn-based JRPG being created by former SMT devs. Seems to be another JRPG in a school setting where our cast members fight to maintain their sanity, utilizing demonic forms of themselves to do battle and clear dungeons. It'll have multiple routes with multiple characters and will require multiple playthroughs. So far it seems ambitious and somewhat unique despite being in such familiar territory. I'll definitely have to keep my eye out on this one and see how it goes. Not sold yet, but I'm interested. And Bandai Namco recently filed a bunch of new trademarks, and if you look way down here at the bottom of the list, yeah, that's Baton Kaidos. Both of them. I don't know what this means yet, but I'm hoping for the best. I made it to the end of Eternal Wings as a teenager, but could not beat the final boss. My deck was half filled with rotten fruit and I was too dumb or stubborn to fix it. So I've had a score to settle with this game ever since. And I mean, it's a great game. I look forward to settling that score. Really hoping this is getting a re-release, hopefully with a new voice cast attached to it. Though the original voice cast was so bad and charming that I hope it's still in there as an option. Anyway, it is time, Bandai. The Xeno series has drummed up enough public interest in legacy monolith titles that I think it's time we all get fed. Bring us Baton Kaidos, bring us the Xeno Saga. Please, we are begging for it. We are ready for it. For upcoming games to look forward to, we have Legend of Mana releasing on June 24th, Scarlet Nexus releasing on June 25th, moving into July, on July 9th, we have Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD releasing on July 16th, Akiba's Trip North American release this time, last time I reported the Japanese one, is releasing on July 20th. This one I'm really looking forward to. Next we have Neo The World Ends With You releasing on July 27th, I haven't played the last one yet. I tried, it hurt my hand. I'll get back to it someday. And on July 27th, once again, we have the great Ace Attorney Chronicles. And back to the bigger stories. Now, E3 has once again come and gone. Let's start with day one. Ubisoft announced a new Mario plus Rabbids game titled Sparks of Hope. Very JRPG style title. I guess this shouldn't come as a shock considering the positive response to the last Mario and Rabbids game, a game my wife really enjoyed but is still sadly in my backlog. But it is a game that I look forward to getting to eventually. It, it actually looks really good. And this new one, looking really good too. They also announced a new Avatar game, Frontiers of Pandora, based on the James Cameron movie. I've not got much interest in this. Despite seeing Avatar in theaters years back and enjoying it at the time, I really remember very little about the movie and can't say I care too much about revisiting its universe anytime soon. Or at all, really. I do think it's funny this will likely be releasing before the second Avatar movie does, as it's been in development for so long. This is probably just a marketing attempt to get people interested in the movie series again ahead of its release, as I really don't see Avatar 2 standing any chance of hitting the sales number the first one did. Gearbox had their show and... <laughs> Eh, some of the presentation was set on the sets for the upcoming Borderlands film, which was kinda neat to see, I guess, plus Eli Roth was there, always a treat seeing him around. Much to the confusion of audiences everywhere, the can-only-be-possible-on-PS5 game Godfall will now be coming to PlayStation 4, so this is definitely no longer a next-gen exclusive. Given its middling reviews, I'm guessing this is purely to make up for the lackluster sales and will be a pretty stripped-back experience, technically. Homeworld 3 got announced as well, but like the Dragon Quest 12 announcement from earlier, it was just another logo reveal. There was also the Devolver Digital event, and I really do mean event, their shows are always events. There wasn't really anything games-wise that I cared for there, but uh, it's Devolver Digital, you gotta see their shows to believe them, and they are always a fun time. So. Such was day one. Not exactly a big one, but you know what, it had one or two things that were at least a little bit interesting. So I feel free in calling it a win. Day two was simultaneously better and worse. Higher highs, lower lows. Let's start with Microsoft and Bethesda. Starfield got a trailer. It's more than it was before, but still not much. Just a clip of somebody taking off in a ship. Next, The Outer Worlds 2 was revealed, as well as a Sea of Thieves expansion featuring Pirates of the Caribbean characters. No Bill Nye though, no will I buy. 
<laughs> what I, I wasn't gonna buy the game anyway. Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl got announced. It's nice to see that the series is returning. Then Microsoft revealed a refrigerator. I get it. It's funny. I like the joke. It's really for sale. Um, not much else to see there for me though. Square Enix's presentation was, uh, woof. Let's start. The Guardians of the Galaxy game. Not something I'm interested in, but it'll probably actually be okay. It seems a little more in line with older Bioware games than it does with uh, the new Avengers game, which easily makes it a more attractive experience to me, but still not one I'm gonna play. Platinum returned to show off Babylon's fall again, and oh man, Babylon ain't the only thing that's fallen if you catch my drift. This one hurts. I don't know what happened here, but uh, like, they changed the art direction to look a little more hand-painted with softer palettes and brush strokes and stuff, and that's all well and good, but the resolution. I feel like somebody smeared Vaseline over the screen. Uh, come on guys, we're trying to play a game here, right? Not film special effects for Star Wars Episode 4. I'm really hoping this cleans up or just looks better before launch, but my optimism for the title has, uh, babble long gone at this point. And finally, we got a reveal for the previously rumored Final Fantasy Origin Stranger of Paradise. The Souls-like edgy Final Fantasy 1 tie-in game being developed by Team Ninja. So here's the thing. The trailer is really embarrassing. It's basically one Windows Movie Maker title card and an Evanescence song away from being an AMV from 2006. I'm here to kill chaos. 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 Feel the pain! The rule of cool stick is getting really tiring, and the character designs look like they just picked up clothes off the shelf at Walmart. Basically, whatever was on sale. However, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. In game and in context, some of this stuff may be better than it appears. Maybe the clothes all get covered up with armor sets. Maybe the chaotic dialogue will be spread out enough that it doesn't make me want to wince. There is a demo, and I will try it out. However, here on day one, when the demo became available, you're able to download it, but an error prevents you from opening it. This is probably going to be the year's biggest faux pas presentation-wise. The game just can't catch a break, and really, it just didn't land how it should have. Otherwise, on this day, Modus Games revealed Solstice, a dark sort of action RPG that really should have had a bigger spotlight. I feel like this is gonna go under a lot of people's radars. And for me, that was day two. On day three, Capcom announced the remaster and official first Western release of The Great Ace Attorney, which I never played before and would like to check out. Otherwise, day three might as well have not even taken place. Day four. This was Nintendo's day to shine, and they really did. Granted, the bar was set pretty low, but they shined nonetheless. We got announcements for the return and remakes of the Advance Wars series. I will say, I don't like the new art direction much and vastly preferred the original, but if the gameplay is just as fun as it used to be, then all is well. I really enjoyed what I played of these back in the day. Kazuya was announced as a new fighter for Smash Bros, and curiously, even to me, I found this more exciting than the Pyra and Mithra reveal. I have a soft spot for Tekken. Tekken 3 especially, and all of its ridiculous cutscenes. It's still one of my all-time favorite fighting games. Hearing the music in the Smash trailer just tickled me in a way. Danganronpa was announced to be coming to Switch as well. The three main games and a new game based off a previous minigame. This will be sold as an all-in-one type package, but at this point, it does not include Ultra Despair Girls. To some extent, I feel the Switch will be missing some valuable context in the overall Danganronpa-verse, but new players should be fine regardless. I'm not going to be getting this, but I'm happy to see it getting out there. The biggest shock of the day by far came in the form of Metroid Dread. Metroid Dread is apparently not Metroid Dead, at least not anymore. So I really didn't see this coming, and so far it's looking pretty fun. I'm still more excited for Prime 4, but Dread is looking great. Breath of the Wild 2 closed out the show, and this is also looking fantastic. Breath of the Wild 1 is, at this point, my favorite open world game, which may be controversial to some people, but it's one of a few open world games I felt very encouraged to explore at my own leisure, to set markers and waypoints myself and just investigate. It inspired something in me I don't usually get elsewhere, not in other open world games or really anywhere else, so I'm quite looking forward to this sequel. The game I'm most excited for today, however, is also the one I'm most disappointed in. Fatal Frame 5 is no longer tied to the Wii U. Yay, everybody rejoice. And while that makes it seem like I may be able to retire this PAL copy that I can't even play on my region-locked console, annoyingly, this release is once again 
digital only, and I just don't get it. Y'all will make physical copies for Blue Reflection, an IP you hardly advertised, hardly sold any copies of, and pretty well sent out into the world to die. But you can't make physical copies for a series that has a long-standing following? Listen, Koei, I'm not mad, okay? But I'm... I'm just very disappointed. Oh, also, uh, Shimagami Tensei 5. Now, for the Tark Talks on Tark Talks. So, thing is, I've been doing this program for just around two years. The first couple videos weren't called Tark Talks, and they're not in the Tark Talks playlist, but for all intents and purposes, they were the same thing. Now, it probably doesn't seem like I've been doing it for that long, because I upload these so incredibly inconsistently, like two to three videos every four to five months. And I joke and I have fun with the idea that all this info is out of date by the time I bring it to you guys, and for some reason, you guys show up to listen to me talk anyway. And while that aspect of the show certainly doesn't bother me, what I'm finding is every time I make one of these, I cram so many stories into them that I never give myself much room to go too in-depth with any of them. Sometimes it feels like I'm just reading headlines and reacting to that, rather than getting into the actual story. And sometimes cutting the stories down to even just that little bit, I find myself having to cut stories out entirely. And between you and me, this is... <laughs> This program is kind of a pain in the ass to edit, and I don't want to make the episodes too long. And really, I just don't feel like this type of program is all that suited for long-form content. That said, I'm okay with the pain in the ass that it is to edit these, but I want that pain in the ass to feel good for you guys. I mean, what's the point of the pain in the ass if nobody's getting off? So what I'm thinking is this. Tark Talks is going to get smaller, and hopefully more frequent. Many of you have told me that I need to do these more often, and I hear that loud and clear. I'm not going to, however, make Tark Talks frequent enough that it becomes the main focus of the channel. It's quite frankly not what I want this channel to be. So I'm thinking in scaling the show back, I can handle the segments a little bit differently. There's gonna be less topics per episode, but they'll at least be more topical and hopefully a little more in depth. I'm I'm guessing episodes will run 10 to 14 minutes as opposed to the 17 to 27 that they have been, but I am really hoping with less topics per episode I'll at least be able to be more informative with the topics. Because that is really what I want to do on this channel. I, I want to be helpful and I want to be able to inform you guys on things. Like just earlier, I passed it off as a nonchalant joke, but part of me would like to look more in depth on the Kuro no Kiseki cast, but I feel like it would have pushed this video to be an uncomfortable length. So this is where I need your input. Tark Talks is continuing continuing, but it will be changing. I'd like to know what you guys want to see in the program going forward. How often you would like to see episodes, what kind of value you give to the individual segments of this show, how much bullshit do you want, like the dumb jokes or skits I sometimes put at the open or the close of video. The things that, you know, I film but I really have no space for in my regular content so they get passed off to Tark Talks. You know, like this is some sort of variety show or something. Uh, yay or nay on the dumb shit. I mean, I like the dumb shit, but I get if some of you maybe thinks it hurts the program. So yeah, just let me know in the comments below what you guys think. Just lay it on me. I'm ready to cry myself to sleep with all the criticism I'm going to receive and then pretend that I internalized it maturely and changed my program in a healthy manner. But this is where I'm going to end today's program. If you guys liked the video or found it useful at all, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials and my Patreon support page are in the description below, and as always, folks, Thanks for watching. Don't forget to let me know what you're thinking in the comments below. Hey guys, it's me, Dark Shadows Sasuke X 77X. This is my new AMV. It's for Final Fantasy. Uh, I I really thank you for requesting it. Uh, I really like this song. <laughs>